All right, here we go again. Hopefully you've had a chance to watch part one where I talked about matter waves. In this video, this is the second one, we're gonna be able to go ahead and move on and talk about atomic orbitals. So hopefully you know something about those three pieces of information that I have over there on the left so that we can talk about this really cool stuff. I'm just gonna go ahead and remind you of a couple just real quick key components of the first video. First, electrons behave like standing waves. They're matter waves, that's very important. Remember that nodes have something to do with energy and the more nodes you have, the higher energy you are. Remember that not all solutions are valid. If you wanna be able to talk about standing waves, you have to be able to allow for only certain situations to be valid. Other ones just are not valid. And then lastly, we have this big idea of matter waves that was this very abstract concept, still is an abstract concept, but remember we are gonna talk about the probability of finding an electron because that's the tangible thing that we can actually get after as long as we are willing to do the mathematical manipulation of the wave function. Hopefully you guys know that I hate putting up a bunch of text on slides, but I have to get through a few of these things. I'm going to define atomic orbitals are regions in space around a nucleus where you can find the electrons sitting there behaving like waves, doing what they do. It is good to know that up to two electrons can actually exist in the same atomic orbital. So they actually exist in the same space and they have the same wiggles about them. There are these things called the quantum numbers that you plug into equations and they can tell you all sorts of good things, what the actual solutions are n is the principal quantum number i need you thinking energy 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 that's what all of this stuff is about is what energies are these electrons at are they at low energies that would be very few nodes or high energies lots of nodes the node idea is this in particular n the principal quantum number minus one is the number of nodes that the electron will have in its standing wave around the atom there's another quantum number that's typically L, it's called the sublevel, and it is a quicker way for us to describe what type of orbital you're looking at. Typically, you're, you're gonna have your S, P, D, and F, and that will make more sense to you in just a moment. All right, so here's the deal. Why should anybody care about this? Well, this is quantum at its finest. The idea that you have one energy level you can be at, you have an energy level that is not valid, and then you have another energy level that you can be at, and it's a stepping stone. And so we're talking about the energy of the electrons. If you can understand this stuff, all of a sudden you can understand bonding between atoms. That's gonna be the constructive interference of these waves, one atom and another atom. You can understand electron transitions. That means you can know why certain fireworks are certain colors. You can understand the geometry of a molecule, perhaps speculate if it's gonna be polar or nonpolar, and you can predict reactions. We can do all of this with the mathematics of quantum. But on to the good stuff. So let's start talking about this core fundamental idea, these atomic orbitals. So here's your first atomic orbital. It is an S orbital, we call it. S orbitals are always spheres. That's a coincidence that the S, the, it doesn't, it's not S for sphere. I think it's for sharp, actually. Uh, there's some history where these things got all their letters from. But let's make sure you understand what you're looking at. So you would have a nucleus that's sitting in the middle of that sphere. The sphere itself is something about how the electron wiggles around it. That sphere contains the probability that you would find the electron 95% of the time inside of that. It's a little bit of an arbitrary number. Usually people go with 95%. But that actually means there is a probability, there is a chance that the electron can be outside of that. It just usually isn't. It's normally inside of the sphere. So for every n, the principal quantum number, for every n, there's only one way that you can have an s orbital and that's a sphere so it has all the symmetry so geometry you know which way you turn it it doesn't change anything but now we can have different n values and remember those principal quantum numbers those are related to the number of nodes so the way that we would write this we, we would say the 1s the 2s the 3s and so on and the one is talking about the principal quantum number remember n minus one is the number of nodes 
And as you get more nodes, you go to higher energies. And so I'm showing these, these are roughly to size scale. These higher energy ones, they're bigger. That means the electrons are more spread out around the nucleus. They have nodes, they're higher energies. So let's take a look at each of these individually for a moment. So calibrate yourself to this chart. I'm showing the probability of finding the electron versus the radius away from the center. And so there is actually a middle point where at some point it is the most probable radius away from the center that you would find the electron. Now you might find it closer, you might find it further away. And the way that we would make this sphere is we would cap this off at some point and we would capture 95% of the chance that we would find the electron at some line. And so I'm showing that to you here. And then where this line is, that's where we're gonna draw the boundary of that sphere. So this has zero nodes. This is very low energy. The 2s orbital, it's gonna have a node. And if you look at it, the color coding is just helping you visualize as you go from uh, one part of the wave function to across a node to another part of the wave function. So there is a single node that's in here and it is the location where you cannot actually have any electron density. So there is no probability of finding the electron at this location. So here's the nucleus. You might find it here. You will not find it here, impossible. Then there's this whole region where you could find it again and we'll cap it off with that 95% and we'll draw the boundary. So here's the 3s, that means I'm gonna have two nodes. Remember it's n minus one nodes. And so I've got these two locations where I will never find the electron. And of course I can go to the 4s and that means I'm gonna have three nodes and I've got three locations here. These are the simple ones, these are the s orbitals. Now the next type is called a p orbital. And what's interesting about a p orbital is that they always will look like these dumbbells, we call them, and they always have a geometric node. And so what you were looking at before, those were radial nodes. As the radius increases, you might run across a node. This is a geometric node. And so there is actually this in-between plane where the electron cannot exist. So the nucleus would be sitting in here still, somewhere in the middle. There are three different p orbitals for a particular principal quantum number. So let me give you an example. When n is equal to 2, you're going to have the 2px, 2py, 2pz. So they are just different orientations about the Cartesian coordinates there. So just take those dumbbells and start rotating them. Now all three of these are sitting on the atom all at the same time. Now as we start to add more nodes though to a p orbital, so I'm going up in my principal quantum number and I gotta add more nodes. Here I am sitting at one node, that geometric node, and now I'm gonna start adding these radial nodes to these things. So it still looks like a dumbbell. There's this kind of plane in here where the electron cannot exist. And as you shoot up in this direction, now this time on a radius, you would run across this little node in here. And so that one has two. So increase the energy again. All right, now you've got d orbitals. We say these things look like clovers and you can perhaps see a trend that's happening. These will always have two geometric nodes. There are five d orbitals. There's a pattern to this, this explanation I'm giving you. It goes 1s orbital, 3p, 5d, and it will be 7f, so it just jumps up by two every time. There's gonna be these five d orbitals they always have to have two geometric nodes. And so you can see these four here are clovers. Uh, they have different orientations. It's not as simple as an XYZ orientation. So obviously there's four of them, but those all look like clovers. And then there's the, you know, almost like a P orbital with a donut around it. And the way you justify the two nodes is you have these two conical nodes. So I am showing the simplest of the d orbitals. So each of these can have two electrons in it. So I could have 10 total electrons occupying the three d orbitals. So this one is called an f orbital. This is the last of the kind of the orbitals that you will actually use in practice. There's theoretically more types of orbitals than this, uh, but the periodic table is only so large. So in my class, certainly we say that the official geometric descriptor of an f orbital is crazy. Uh, they always are gonna have three nodes. There are gonna be seven of them. They can be perhaps these little like six-sided 
like almost like clovers except six sided. Uh, these are two clovers on top of each other. So there's actually eight lobes. Here's kind of the double inner tube around the P orbital sort of thing. And the way that this works is there's actually four of these types that are of different geom or different orientations. And then there are two of these of different orientations. And then there's just one of those guys. And I'm showing you how now you have your three geometric nodes. And so I've got two conical and one right across the middle. Putting it all together, and this is where the energy idea comes in again. I'm going to construct a little chart with you guys here. First, we're going to talk about the n value, the principal quantum number. Remember, you need to be thinking number of nodes, and you also need to be thinking about energy. Chemistry is a subject about energy. And so these are, is this a low level, a low energy electron, or is this a high energy electron that might want to react or do something? Let's put up the number of geometric nodes. So I'm making a distinction. You can either be a geometric node or you can be a radial node like I showed you with all of those spherical s orbitals. If I have zero geometric nodes, I have to be an s orbital. So if I have an n value of 1, n minus 1 is my number of nodes, boom, you're looking at your s orbital there. I can have an n value of two, that means I have one node, and I can still have zero geometric nodes. It just means that I am an s orbital that has a single radial node in here. And I can continue this trend. And so I could say, okay, well now I have two nodes, now I have three nodes. But if I have one geometric node now, that's gonna make me a p orbital. And there are three ways that I can have those. Hopefully you can recognize that it is impossible to have a 1p orbital. That would be a principal quantum number of 1 and still be a p orbital. That's because this principal quantum number of 1 would have to have zero nodes. I can't have a p orbital unless I have at least one node available to you. Okay, so my simplest p orbital has to jump down. It has to be at the n equals 2 value. Now, I can still stick with the one geometric node, and I can start jumping down this list a little bit, but you'll notice that I still only have one geometric node, but now I'm moving into adding in those radial nodes. So I can keep this trend going. What if I insist on having two geometric nodes? That makes me, by requirement, a d orbital. Impossible to have a 1d. It's impossible to have a 2d. You have to have at least two nodes available to you. That means I don't get d orbitals until I get to the principal quantum number of 3. And I have the 5, and they kind of look like this here. And so certainly I could have four d orbitals, and they are going to have one radial node each. And so you can kind of see what those look like. Now I can go to my f orbitals, and again, you can see how this pattern is emerging. Can't do it there, can't do it there, can't do it there. I actually cannot have f orbitals until I get to the principal quantum number of four, so that I have a minimum of three nodes available to me. Now I'm sure that was a ridiculous amount of information that I gave you. Let's just really quickly look at the take home messages. Atomic orbitals are visualizations for how the electron actually behaves around a nucleus. We are looking at the probability of finding an electron on the standing wave. More nodes generally means higher energies. When you learn how to fill electrons, you'll learn that there are some subtleties to that rule. The very next step that you would do is you would take this basic information about these atomic orbitals and there are very clear patterns for how they are laid out on the periodic table. You will know of the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. That's where this is coming from. It causes their reactivity. And you can learn how to actually fill them in based on true energy levels. So it is a very fundamental idea, but it's actually pretty cool stuff. Uh, I hope you picked up some of it. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk in detail about that stuff on this video. This one's probably already running pretty long. Uh, hopefully, you got some of that. If you did, let your computer know.